And this is a very live Hangout on Air. It is the second today on our World Wildlife Day extravaganza, March 3rd, 2014. Except, well, on the opposite side of the world, on across the Pacific, uh, it seems to be March 4th. So greetings to good friends Denise, Rhonda, and Gaston over there in Australia. Uh, hello there. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Rhonda, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Wildlife Tourism Australia? Okay. Yeah, Wildlife Tourism Australia started, I think, 11 or 12 years ago um, to be uh, to support um, the sustainable development of a diverse wildlife tourism industry that supports conservation. So we're about all kinds of wildlife tourism and all kinds of non-consumptive wildlife tourism in Australia. We're not into trophy hunting or big game fishing and all that sort of thing, but we are into especially viewing wildlife uh, in the wild, you know, koalas, kangaroos, birds, butterflies, everything, and into the, into the wild native e ecosystems, but also wildlife parks and zoos and even museums. But um, yeah, our main focus is native wildlife in the wild, including bird watching, whale watching, scuba diving on the barrier reef, everything. And um, our membership, we um, it's all over Australia and also some from Germany and Japan and other places as well. But uh, yeah, we, um, we want members who, and they agree when they join, uh, support conservation, support animal welfare, um, are not prejudiced in uh, you know, sort of against nationalities, races, whatever, and um, give good interpretation because yeah, we we've all been to places where the um, where the commentary is absolutely ridiculous, and uh, whereas a good wildlife tour or a good wildlife park gives good information to its visitors. So yeah, so that's more or less what we're on about. And, hey, Rhonda, well, um, uh, who, who's sitting next to you? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, Gaston is uh, our guest from Switzerland. Uh, Gaston has been doing some woofing, that's willing workers on organic farms. And he's planning on becoming, uh, studying to be a vet and hoping to work with wildlife when he is a vet. And uh, at the moment, he's travelling around Australia. So his first platypus just recently, and uh, he's been helping us build. Because uh, I also run wild um, wildlife tours through Aracaria Eco Tours. That's our own company, and Gaston's been helping us build a um, composting toilet for tourists, and uh, helping with some experimental plots where I'm doing some research on the birds that disperse the seeds of native plants and with the butterfly walk we would plant it. Um, excuse me, is, is that called frugivory? That's right, that's right. It's like carnivory is meat eating, frugivory is fruit eating. Very good. Oh, I've learned from you, Rhonda. Well, Gaston, welcome, bonjour, and good day. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, let, let's move over to Denise. Uh, Denise, uh, Introduce yourself, and, and where are you with those beautiful, large, sunny windows in the background? <laughs> uh, I live in Darwin River, which is about 80 kilometres southwest of Darwin in the Northern Territory, top of Australia. Um, I've been guiding for just over 30 years, work as a biological consultant and the author or co-author of several fauna books. Um, uh, uh, what can I say? I was a founding member of Eco Tourism Australia. What is now Eco Tourism Australia? Um, I work with Aboriginal people. I'm a member of an Aboriginal family, adopted by marriage, and according to my mum, by ancestry as well. Um, I use the community work approach because many of these people are semi-traditionally. So my approach to ecotourism, wildlife tourism has been very much bottom up, bottoms up, and that fits in with bird watching as well. That's bird watching tends to be much more than general wildlife tourism bottoms up. I've got new new bottoms up approach. Um, I've written several papers, for instance, 
one on the value of dead animals to ecotourism. Um, I'm doing a PhD, and the topic of my PhD is the value of, no, not the value, um, American US bird watchers who, were, who travel as couples internationally. And the topic is a review of, I'm sorry, what is the topic of your research? The topic is uh, bird watchers who travel as internationally as couples, American bird watchers who are married or in a stable relationship and they travel as couples internationally. All, virtually all the work that has been done in ecotourism, wildlife tourism, bird watching tourism has been on individuals and couples present a completely different dynamic what they can do. That's very interesting. I'd, I'd imagine, you know, one of the things that I've seen over and over are the are the couples that are looking for divergent activities. Yeah, yeah, that's well, that's right. Well, often you'll get uh, in a couple you have one that's very serious about birding, maybe treats it as a trophy activity. You know, just wants to go out, take off, take new birds off a list, and his or her spouse will actually moderate that activity. So with a listing you'll often get people who want to say disturb a bird for a better look, even if that bird's nesting. Or in my case, I want to go down right down onto the banks of a muddy river and look for great build heron when I know there are crocs in the water. And I'll be saying, No you don't <laughs> and their wife the bloke's wife is almost always a, a bloke. His wife will be saying, Now dear, no, you listen to our, listen to the guide <laughs> and so that 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 spouse acts as a moderating influence. So they're really interesting dynamics when, when you come to couples. And uh, and uh, I, from my experience, couples fit in much better with them, with uh, semi-traditional people living on art stations as well. Well, that, that seems to be fascinating to the tenth degree. We'll come back to some of. We'll come back to a lot of that, and that's just wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious. Uh -oh. I, I'm kind of curious. Uh, are you in the range where you'd where you would find the pied butcher bird? Uh, it's found over most of Australia, and our, yes, we have three here. Uh, there, a group. There's a there's a group of animals here that have, that have been fed for about 25 years by previous owners, and included in that is these three butcher birds. Mm. And, so and is the song as lovely as they say? Yes, in fact, uh, I know a lady who did her PhD on um, on Pied Butcher Bird Song. Um, Was that Gail Johnson? Hollis, Hollis Taylor. Hollis Taylor. Oh. She's a famous violinist, and she she did a PhD on uh, Pied Butcher Bird Song. Mm. Very interesting. Hey, let me show you something oh, a little trick here. Back. Let me show so, you a little trick here. Um, this is uh, the this on Google Hangouts. Why we like it. Is that you can show often? You can show a screen, and mm -hmm. you know just by coincidence, I was listening. It's to Hollis. The, Hollis, yes. <laughs> you see that, and I was listening to uh, this program from uh, Radio Three Hundred and Sixty, and yeah, Hollis Taylor, and this program that's uh, currently online, ABC Radio National, Bird Interrupted, and they were doing this wonderful chat with this fellow who owns a B and B in Alice Springs, and they were talking about this being in the Northern Territory. And they had little clips of the bird, but it was just in transit. Mm. Mm. Hollis, yes. Yeah, they they, ha they have a, a beautiful clear whistle, and each bird uh, develops his own little bit of melody. There's one here uh, that goes, Ooh, I can't whistle, <laughs> so I can't do it properly, but it goes, Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. and I get the Laurel and Hardy theme going through my head. There was one on Kangaroo Island that goes, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, there's different melodies uh, in <laughs> everywhere you listen to them. Fantastic, uh, and and that's a nocturnal bird. No, 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 no. no. they're diurnal. They're diurnal. We've also got silver, a, a pair of silver-backed butcher birds here, and and oh. it's interesting to compare their songs here. They don't hang around so much. They're not near the house. The pie butcher birds tend to be quite aggressive. Yeah. Well, uh, let me um, <clears throat> repeat a story I heard years ago, um, and I would like to know if the situation has changed. Uh, 
and the big question is this: Are the the state or local tourism authorities, the the information kiosk, the websites, are they really geared at all to providing travelers with tips on wildlife tourism? Because Not I remember really. I remember someone <laughs> I remember someone years ago saying that uh, people bird watchers would you know go to the tourism offices not find any information about birding and then go to the birding groups That's and right. consult with them and then because no one was consulting the tourism offices anymore the folks in the tourism thought well no one's interested in birding. That's right. Oh Rhonda, who, who might have this have been? Yeah, I think this might have been me that told you that. Yeah, I, I, I did a, um, I did a, I did a research paper with Daryl Jones a few years ago, and yeah, it came up less than four percent of bird watchers in Australia would go to a t travel agent to find out anything about bird watching, and uh, yeah, as you say, it's a, it, it's a vicious circle because they don't go to the travel agents, so the travel agents don't yeah. think bird watching is important so they don't get any information about it and yeah. even less incentive. Things are improving a little bit in some of the visitor information centres now there are at least some good bird lists and uh, some tips on where to go to see the birds but um, yeah we've still got a bit to go and some of the people in uh, the um, main tourism organisations now are starting to take bird watching a little bit more seriously and realizing that uh, yeah it's not just a tiny little eccentric thing on the edge that yeah maybe maybe we should be thinking about bird watching but there's still a lot of still a lot of people there that um, haven't got the message yet Denise your point I'm sorry what was that wrong um, well, how would you respond how how would you see how how would you uh, evaluate how the tourism authorities agents the information kiosk. I mean, are they talking up? Are they are they educating visitors about wildlife tourism? Well, tourism in the Northern Territory was built uh, was basically sightseeing. The history of tourism in the Northern Territory is basically sightseeing, and that means mass tourism. And um, what the Northern Territory government did back in the 1970s was try to establish big operators, big accommodation, big operators. And so they they actually put the squeeze, and there's research, I've got a paper on this, they put, they put the squeeze on small operators, whether they were um, people like myself, my ex-husband, Hilary Thompson, who was a world-class birding guide, or uh, small providers' accommodation so that those big businesses would be viable. Um, it's then seemed to splinter into a lot of medium-sized businesses, but it was still basically sightseeing. <clears throat> and so even today, very, very few tour operators can provide um, a good knowledge about you know, a range of wildlife, including bird watching. Um, probably, well, one of the birders that's promoted by Tourism NT has got four years experience birding and guiding in the Northern Territory. and uh, But that's better than it has been in the past. They will promote people who had no experience and yet they'd paid all, all the, uh, you know, they had public liability insurance, they paid for all the permits and so as far as Tourism NT was concerned they were, they were, they were okay, they were fine. But of course the bottom started falling out of that because when birders went out with these tour operators or guides, they soon found out that they knew very little. And one of these people was um, was Bo Bolans, the fat birder, uh, very famous and loved, beloved um, UK birder. He runs disabled birding tours all over the world. And he came out here a few years ago, and unfortunately I wasn't around to show him, show him around. So he went out with uh, a tour operator that Tourism NT recommended. And he said to me later that this fellow didn't know anything about birds. He said he was a con artist, I knew more about birds than he did. And I'm still getting these tales about various tour operators. So it is improving, but 
the other problem was that when tourist mentees started to realise that bird watching was important, they seized upon a market known as the twitchers. And these are basically people who want to go out and just list birds. It's a minority market. It's a very small market. And not only that, they focus on the UK. Well, there's UK twitchers tend to be younger men who treat it as a sort of a train spotting activity. And the other thing is that they usually do their own research. They don't want to spend money. They do come out here. But it's it's not really a huge or profitable market, especially for tour operators and guides and even accommodation places. Yeah, and uh, yeah, when um, when I did the uh, bird watching research a few years ago, yeah, I was expecting to find a subset of twitchers that just wanted to do the listing, and that was it. But we found even the most what we called the dedicated birders, those that had bird books that could identify all the birds from their home country and knew a lot of the females and juveniles. And yeah, even the most dedicated birders, as we called them. Mm. still put wildlife ecology very yes. high on their list yes. of interest yep. and watching yep. the behaviour yep. of birds. Yep. They weren't yep. people that That's just really saw a bird yeah. and go away again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you'll find, and you'll, find that, you'll find that even those guides who, those guides who concentrate on listers, often yep. um, they'll go out and they'll do all their study and they'll learn their birds but they don't have enough experience or they're not interested in bird behaviour or you know yeah. that tr what trees are fruiting or flowering or what grasses are seeding yeah, and exactly. there's, going to be, there's going to be a zitting sister here because it's low rank grass and this habitat with taller grass is going to there's going to be golden headed cysticlus they can't they don't have enough knowledge or they're not that interested and they really yeah. need to have that information so they can draw people into the whole picture that's right. That's, that's really important, yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, Ron, could I give a plug for my new book on wildlife tourism, handbook for uh, tour operators? And I go into all that sort of thing, the importance of knowing something about the ecology and the background of, and um, all that. But it's on Amazon Kindle, but uh, it'll be coming out in other formats soon. Well, very good. And the title, of the, uh, the title again is what? Um, wildlife Tourism, a handbook for, no I should know this, shouldn't I? A handbook for guides, eco lodges, wildlife parks, oh, uh, business startups, I think, I think, I think. I'm not sure, I'm going to have to look up the title. But anyway, if you, That's if a you great Google, plug. That's a great plug, Rhonda. If you Google Wildlife Tourism. People will remember wrong. They'll remember that you didn't remember the title. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> As I say, again, I, 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 I changed the subtitle a few times, and I can't remember what I ended up with. It's your book. I know. <laughs> Listen, um, actually, I'll call up a picture. Can, can I show a picture of it if I can find it? Well, of course you can, and that's you can. But uh, uh, well, how do I show it? I don't know how to. Well, remember how we did that screen share. You click that. Uh, first of all, you're going to have to. First of all, on your computer, take your time. On your computer, find a screenshot or whatever of the cover, and then yep, on that. the Google Hangout. Okay, once you have it up and you have it online, uh, then on the Google Hangout, click that little icon. You have to hover on the left side and click Screen Share, and then you can share this. And next time, print it out, show it off. <laughs> but uh, well, we're, we're learning. Denise, go ahead. Uh, Aboriginal people that I associate with have dreamings, have particular relationships with particular animals, and um, and one of the things that's come out of my, both my experience and and my research is that, and we we're just talking about this. Even people who are really really serious about birding, what they want more generally than to see new birds is to feel a connection with wildlife. Yeah. And so I, with the blessing of elders that I'm related to, I wrote a book called Quiet Snake Dreaming and it actually explained how we became one family and all about these relationships, these dreamings um, with animals. For instance, um, I was an alderman on Darwin City Council back in the early 1980s and 
uh, there was a, an Aboriginal reserve in my ward and I wanted to represent those people but they just saw me as one of those hate and white people and so the president told me to go out and catch her a snake as a test of my resolve and so she and the other Aboriginal women took me to a huge billabong um, huge muddy billabong with great crocodile tracks around the edges and after four hours in the water I caught a water python and um, that when I became pregnant nine months later the women came around and said to me oh yes we knew you were pregnant and I said how <laughs> I hadn't told you and they said well we knew the day that you caught that snake that you were pregnant because the snake spirit entered your body and so your your baby will have uh, uh, water python dreaming and uh, then they, they went on they said um, the other the other ways that we knew you were pregnant was that you didn't you weren't attacked by a crocodile and it was on the cards they didn't say it like that because they don't have English as the first language and and they said also you caught a snake and nobody believed that in that huge billabong you would catch a snake in that muddy water um, but baby spirits when they enter the mother they, they do two things, they, they keep, they repel predators and they call prey to the mother to be caught so that she can feed herself. So this is a really, really interesting approach to wildlife because, and, and, and to pregnancy because, you know, people think uh, that uh, 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 babies, especially um, when they're not born, are very, very helpless. But according to uh, Gunwingu people, the babies actually have a role in protecting the mother. Yeah, so hmm. so anyway, quiet snake dreaming goes into all of that. And um, when the American writer Jonathan Franzen came out a couple of years ago and spent some time with me, he actually read the book because I was going to take him into Arnhem Land. And he told me later it gave him huge insight into the lives of Aboriginal Australians and helped him understand a, a little of that, that connection they have with wildlife. Again, Denise, you've left me gobsmacked. Oh, yeah, that's uh, and the, the thing about, yeah, the thing about having a dreaming is that, uh, for instance, um, I have um, I have one of my dreams is crocodile. So, for me to harm a crocodile in any way would be, you know, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be the right thing to do. If I killed a crocodile, that would be murder. If I ate crocodile, that would be cannibalism. Although being an older woman, I can now make those judgments for myself. But um, a few years ago, I took um, uh, Sally. Uh, I was making a. Uh, I was it's featuring in a documentary for um, CCN, I think it was, and. Uh, this camera crew wanted me to go uh, canoeing through the mangroves Well, I co-opted a friend into helping me, Sally Thomas, who's now our administrator. And uh, as she was about to get into the canoe, she noticed this tomahawk lying on the bottom of the canoe. And uh, Sally said to me, Denise, what's this for? And I said, well, if we're, we're attacked by a crocodile, you need to pick the tomahawk up and hit it on the head. And uh, Sally said to me, well, why can't you do it? And I said, well, because I've got crocodile dreaming. The most I can do is ask that crocodile politely to leave us alone. Mm, so the trouble is that because of because of the infiltration of Western education and Western values, people these days often look upon this as just superstition. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are losing that contact with animals, especially when they go into white schools or into cities to live. That's a real pity. You know, and of, course, and of course, so many of the Aboriginal children were taken away from the whole adults as well. Over the last hundred years or so, they were just taken right away from anyone that they'd previously associated with and the part of the country that they belonged yeah. in. And that, that's Lost. necessary. We talk about trying to uh, introduce our children to wildlife these days, and yet what chance they have growing up in cities. It's, it's really, really difficult. Let me ask you, um, I was asking, uh, as I say, this is the second hangout I've hosted today for World Wildlife Day. Um, but beyond my pestering emails and Twitter, uh, 
are there parades in the street? How are you folks celebrating World Wildlife Day in Australia? Is there a commotion outside your door? Uh, I Not exactly. We're, we're going out to do some burning off to protect the, the habitat for partridge pigeon and other animals. But did you, yeah, hear from any, did you hear from anyone <laughs> yesterday that yesterday was World Wildlife Day? Yes, you. Yeah. Thank you for reminding no, us. No, and uh, there are there are a few uh, there are a few Facebook messages that came from various parts of Australia today saying Happy World Happy Wildlife Day, World Wildlife Day. Um, yeah, there's a few wildlife conservation groups that have, and we've also heard from. World Wildlife Fund, but um, I wasn't actually aware of world of the World Wildlife Day until just very, very recently. So next year, next year, WTA should really plan something. All we've been able to do this time is just promote it on the web. Oh, by the way, I found a picture of the cover of my book. What do I do again to show it? Please, you have to click that share How? screen. What do I do? So. Yeah. Left uh, what's the shape? Left, hover on the left hand side of the yeah. screen. We're gonna get, get rid of your you're gonna get rid of your video a little bit and you're gonna share the picture that you have on your on your computer, on your laptop. Yeah, so I, I can see on the left which icon do I click on? Where it, the, the one that's green that says screen share. Oh right, that makes sense. And then you'll select whatever image. There you are, and talk over it. Oh, I can see. It. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, Rhonda, what's the name of the book? <laughs> well, I can read it now, can't I? I almost got it right. A hand uh, wildlife tourism, a handbook for tour guides, eco lodges, students, and startup businesses, and it goes into what are the qualities for a good um, wildlife tourism guide or ecological manager or whatever and uh, yeah, going into the wildlife skills, how to find the wildlife, how to view them without uh, disturbing them too much, a um, bit of background ecology and um, what wildlife groups are in this country and not in other countries etc, uh, how it came to be this way, then also people skills, how to do the interpretation um, how to get along with sometimes difficult people, although we find that most wildlife tourists are really nice people. The sort of person that pays to watch wildlife are usually you know, very nice people. But also uh, yeah, into networking, into the um, bureaucratic hassles of starting up your own business with getting the right sort of permits, insurance, which is a big bugbear, you know, the insurance premiums are just going up and up and up. Denise and I have been communicating on uh, how do we make this a little bit easier for um, individual tour guides and businesses. Uh, oh, I can take screen share. How do I take screen share off again and get back to where we were? I uh, just click the screen share button again. Okay, if I can find it. Click there. Oh, just click there. Yeah. Merci, Gaston. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I put it backwards now. Um, what do what I do? You, you're fine right now. We see you, Rhonda. Oh, okay. Good. Hello. You know, if we do this on a regular basis, and my hope is that we do have these uh, wildlife and parks uh, chats on a regular basis, um, you know, it'll just become simpler and simpler. I mean. Yes, it, and it's it's my view, and you know, we did this with uh, the Snake is Sister workshop back in was it October, November? Yeah. You know, to me, there's no reason why we can't uh, have these hybrid conferences that have you know the face-to-face -face connection as well as something online. So, you know, while it would be nice, while it would be nice if we could all be in the same room and chatting. Uh, it's a lot simpler and there's a lot less jet lag and a lot less carbon expenditures if we have this as a hangout right now. And if we have, if we really give a good uh, think to the future of uh, tourism conferences, particularly in Australia, I think we should figure out ways in which, you know, the events take place on the ground and have 
meaningful participation uh, and engagement for remote participants, which leads me into you know the the promotion and the preview of what's going to happen this November, and that is the World Parks Congress will take place in Sydney, Australia. Um, that's being uh, facilitated by the hosted by the New South Wales government and the IUCN, and it will be a big event in Sydney. Um, I have you know, I've asked, but you know, so far I don't know if there will be any live streaming from that event. But I I certainly hope so because you know an event of this caliber that brings people from around the world together I think really should be streamed live. So, you know, fingers are crossed that that happens. Yeah, uh, WTA is going to have a meeting the day before in Sydney as well, so maybe we can live stream a bit of that. By the way, I'm seeing my, lo my logo and oh, my name to back to front. Up. I'm seeing it back to front. Do you it's see it back, back to front? front for me. You're, you're seeing okay. it. I don't you're know why I'm seeing mine back to front. You're, you're anyway, seeing, okay, you, you're not, you that's fine. <laughs> You're seeing the mirror image and mirror uh, image, and there's a way to convert that. But uh, again, all of these things they change okay. every. every oh, that's okay. Okay. More importantly, Wildlife Tourism in Australia is going to have a day in Sydney just before. That's be on November the 11th, um, just before the World Congress begins. Uh, just a fairly informal sort of workshop, and maybe we can live stream that because uh, it it'll be. Um, in preparation for the Congress, we'll be looking at um, how to minimise uh, negative impacts when we're viewing wildlife in national parks, what sort of research we need, including research on not only the animals that tourists go in there to see, but on all the other things, like when you're spotlighting looking for, kang for uh, koalas and possums and so on, you may be disturbing bandicoots and other little ground-dwelling animals that you don't even, you're not even aware of guides are often not aware of because they scurry out of your way before you get there. So yeah, you know, what sort of research do we need on the possible negative impacts and how to minimize them? Also want to discuss how can we make positive impact and um, in, and oh, also using tech, using both old technologies and new technologies to minimize negative impact while getting good wildlife viewing experience for our, for our visitors. And on the positive side, uh, one of the things is tour operators engaging in wildlife research and monitoring. And um, to that end, Wildlife Tourism Australia has started a wildlife research network. We've got a new wild uh, we've got a new website for that. We started one last year, it's, but that's all being refreshed and getting uh, bigger and better and all that. And uh, it's for wildlife tour operators that are either involved in wildlife research or conservation monitoring and wanting to network with each other. You know, some, um, some may want to collaborate, like some of the whale watchers already do, to, to look at whale migration up the, um, up the coast of Australia. Well, they can do that with other migratory animals or collaborate with um, just sharing observations to get enough observations for statistical analysis, uh, or just say... What about making this into citizen science? Because there are quite a few yeah. citizen projects well, going well, part of it. Yeah, 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 I was getting on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, another part of that is calling for volunteers who want to, uh, either volunteers or sometimes paying volunteers who want to join in with that research. Uh, because we're tourism focused, we're looking at um, tourists joining in with the research, as they do in um, Earthwatch, Conservation Volunteers Australia. Some of their some of their projects are research, uh, and uh, yeah, we heard from the um, uh, Echidna Walkabout people at our workshop last year, who were doing research on koalas in the Yu Yangs in Victoria, and uh, take tourists along with them. Uh, tourist involvement can be anything from just helping to carry equipment. Or helping to find the animals, or we, um, yeah, we do get scientists on tour as well. We get uh, biology professors, environmental science students, who could actually play, a, a, you know, a little bit more of a role in um, 
even you know, identifying some of the uh, some of the birds that are coming to fruiting trees and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Another way that tour operators can be involved in research is to uh, provide free transport to scientists from universities and other institutions that would love to do research on something but just cannot get the travel funding to go to all these great places that the tour operator is going to. Now, uh, I on eye to eye encounters uh, in North Queensland, they're, a, they're one of the, the wildlife tourism members. They give uh, free trips out to the coral reef every now and then for, mm -hmm. um, uh, for scientists studying the minke whales and uh, other animals of that area. So, yeah, there's all sorts of ways that wildlife tour operators and eco-lodge managers that'll, that give um, reduced price or even free accommodation to, uh, to researchers that are uh, yeah, researching the wildlife or doing conservation monitoring. Um, yeah, or wildlife parks that allow them to come in and observe their animals. So there's all sorts of ways that wildlife tour operators are very well placed to assist with basic wildlife research and with conservation monitoring. Um, and so we're going to be discussing that at this just very informal wildlife tourism workshop the day before the World Parks Congress begins and we can go in really focused on uh, the sorts of questions we want to ask others during that Congress, some of the messages we might like to get across, uh, where Australia is, how we can compare that to what other countries are doing and so on. Let me ask We're you not this. quite sure you, yet. Let me ask you this, do you see ways in which the wildlife, the, wildlife, uh, the World Parks Congress uh, can be a facilitator for tours to your members? Well, they already are in that uh, Alan Galanders has been accepted by the, uh, by the um, organisers of the World Parks Congress to showcase the um, World Heritage, um, yeah, the World Heritage listed areas of the wet tropics in far north Queensland. Another two of our members, Barry Davies of Gondwana Guides and who was, who Denise will remember from our conference in Darwin last year. And um, Lisa Groom, she's the granddaughter of the um, of Arthur Groom, who started the excellent Binnaburra Eco Lodge at the edge of Lamington National Park, and she now runs international park tours and other things. Well, she and Barry, between them, are showcasing the uh, World Heritage listed areas of um, southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. And um, yeah, uh, and uh, of course also being in conjunction. I did want Wildlife Tourism Australia to have, to have an, an exhibition at the Congress until I found out it would cost us $5,000. Yeah, that's crazy. Which is a little bit more than we can afford um, mm -hmm. unless, some of, unless some of our wealthier members could contribute. But we're also going to contribute, I think, uh, yeah, Denise, we need the rest of the committee. Oh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that Denise is our I'm the chair and Denise is the vice chair of Wildlife Tourism Australia. Uh, we need to clear with the rest of the committee, protect the Bush Alliance, of which mm -hmm. Wildlife Tourism Australia is a member, one of the founding members in fact, uh, mm -hmm. is going to, uh, uh, they're getting together some sponsorship and going to have a um, exhibition and I'd like Wildlife Tourism Australia to be part of that. Uh, donate towards it, that's what we've got to clear with the committee, and uh, then we can have some Wildlife Tourism Australia uh, mm -hmm. brochures, especially pertaining to what we, what we do for biodiversity conservation, and particularly mm -hmm. um, those aspects of wildlife tourism that mm -hmm. do involve protected areas, most of our one, members. One of, my, one of the thoughts that came out of what you were saying is, I wonder if it might be worthwhile trying to involve other organisations that may be going there. I don't know, but I wonder if Environmental Defenders Office is going to have a stall. Um, yep, yep. We can check uh, that out. EDO and T has a stall at some of the markets here. We actually went down on Sunday to help out, but they didn't turn up for some reason. But I was going to set it up with bird, bird paintings from my bird books. Right. So that they yeah, would, we, we, yeah. that, that would be a visual 
contact for people walking past, you know, draw them into the store. Yeah, so. Yes. We, we, we have done that sort of thing. We have done that sort of thing, but it's usually it usually doesn't cost five thousand dollars. No, of course not. No, oh no, no, I agree. <laughs> My God. Well, well, we'll see how we'll see how this develops. You know, but about six months ago, talking to friends, I was asking, uh, you know, here let's set up some goals for the World Parks Congress, and yeah. you know, to me, the, the there are many honorable intentions of this of this event, and I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can go into my uh, wiki page and show you. Uh, what I've uh, talked about with people, and still I haven't really heard, you know, good feedback from the organizers about some of these specific goals. But I'm going to show you this, and I'd like your feedback. Um, you know, I'm, I'm applauding the event. Uh, at the same point, I think it, you know, at the same point, I think it raises some really big questions. Uh, you know, for example, if this is an event that's taking place in 2014, not 2004 or 1994. So, are we adequately using the social web? And by that I mean, you know, are we are we going to be using live? Are we using video? Are we using Flickr and Facebook and Twitter? Our yeah. presentation is going to be. In it, I'll, I'll ask this of you, uh, Denise and Rhonda. You know, mm -hmm. to upload presentations to SlideShare. Um, <laughs> But that's number one. And number two, you know, I'd like the Congress to provide live streaming video. And we rarely see that at events. Number three, I'd love to see the Congress engage locals in Australia and teach visitors about Australia. And I think it's been a little bit, uh, we're, and we are seeing some, some progress on that. Number four, and again, this, this, and this could go well into what you were just talking about. I'd like the Congress to register satellite events. Now when, for example, TED, the, the event called TED has its TED event in, in Sydney, it also arranges, you know, view only parties where people have a, like another little party outside of the official venue. Why can't we do the same thing? Yeah. Uh, another one, I'd love to see the Congress be particularly, particularly friendly to indigenous peoples. And well, this this will be one of the tracks, but I'd I'd like to see as much as possible dealing with indigenous peoples and parks and tourism. Mm. Also, yeah. and I'll and I'll say just two more, and I'll shut up. And I'd like I want to hear you <laughs> what you say. Uh, love to see the Congress serve as an example of how tourism itself can be embedded in conservation and conservation events. I'm sure you know they'll they'll no doubt be uh, offsetting some of the carbon, but. You know, is this going to be a responsible gathering of these professionals? Well, I'd love to see what they're going to do. And finally, uh, one week ahead of uh, Open Education Week, I'd love to see the Congress serve as an example of open educational resources, open access, and open journalism. And that means, uh, again, the, the concepts that we've had for just 10 years with the advent of Creative Commons and Wikipedia, et cetera, is making much of the information available for open access. And mm. going back, you know, to previous congresses and so many conservation events in the past, you know, the information, the, re the reports would be there, but, you know, five to ten years later. So, you know, hopefully, you know, we can see the event really take on the mantle of open education and open access to, to make this information as, uh, as publicly available as possible. Yeah, that Denise, would be good. Denise, Denise, wait, wait, Ron, I want to come back to you. Denise, you were sure. saying something, and I rudely got you off. No, 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 I rudely in interrupted <laughs> um, on Indigenous peoples. Um, it's really hard to get ind Indigenous people involved in such events. Uh, with we had problems with the workshop, or I had problems with the workshop. One people didn't see; they just thought it was going to be a, a talk fest of white people. Two, we had a we had a very close relative seriously ill, and he died just afterwards. Three, there were people there that yeah, well, I won't go into that, but they they obviously didn't understand where Indigenous people were coming from, and I think that anything like the World Park at Parks Congress needs to be able to see the world through the eyes of Indigenous people. And that isn't just Indigenous people, it's a whole lot of other people as well. 
uh, whereas often these these meetings and organisations and so forth tend to have a top-down approach, even by virtue of the fact that they're in Sydney. Um, one way of addressing it, and you mentioned it, Facebook. Uh, I have dozens of Aboriginal relatives on my Facebook. I'm glad that you don't see their messages, Rhonda, because you'll be quite shocked at some of the language. But, but, <laughs> um, but it gives me a really good well, idea. What the language from whites as well. <laughs> You know, for instance, Vicarina, Stephanie, Stephanie's daughter has been pouring her heart out over Andrew who died. You know, so I can cut, and she, she's been saying, I'm going to go out and get drunk tonight. Well, I can intervene. But that can all, I can also use that as a, as a conduit for, um, you know, for promoting other sorts of stuff. Um, the other thing is education here immediately. I thought of Aboriginal people. You know, Ron, I've got uh, grandchildren who can speak or understand half a dozen different languages. They've got bush skills like you wouldn't believe. They've got social skills to die for. When my son was three years old, he was presented with a newborn baby and told he was now a nakwa. He was now a little daddy. And he was expected to help rear that little boy. I've got two, um, oh, there must be 12 now, twin great-granddaughters. I call them little mummies. And they're supposed to look after me when I get, I'm old and decrepit. Um, and you know, they learn social skills, they learn a sense of responsibility towards themselves, towards others, towards the environment from the time they're toddlers. And yet the, ed the Western society considers them uneducated, ignorant. They may be illiterate. They're certainly not ignorant. And I think this, this World Parks Congress, maybe, maybe we could look at turning that around. Yeah, and um, there, there, there are individual Aboriginal people who would be willing to uh, to come to such events, but eleven thousand, uh, eleven hundred dollars to crazy. attend no, Congress absolutely is no going way. to cut a lot of them out unless they can get some sponsorship. And, and uh, well, I, the question that I would say to me, the question, the big question I say is, or well, what, what? Are there ways to participate if you are a quote unquote remote participant? Mm, and that's uh, hard. And, you know, I'm going to be, you know, and there have to be ways in which we can accommodate. Um, you know, going back, you know, in August, planeta.com is a, is a host of a regular event for the past four years called Indigenous Peoples Week because August 9th is the World's Day of the, of the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. And as a very uh, as a as a non-indigenous person myself, the question is how do you interact and work with indigenous peoples, and how do you listen, and how do you respond, and how do we focus on on tourism, and this avenue in which there are ways of interacting, and having an online conference or an unconference for the past four years, it's it's been slow growing, but it's been really quite successful. The SlideShare presentation that I uploaded last year for Indigenous Peoples Week was viewed more than 40,000 times. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a really good intro. Now the question is, building into this, and as you both have experience, the question, is, the question primarily for the non-Indigenous person is just fr frankly, how to listen, and how to listen over time. You know the work that I the work that I've done, particularly in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, you know many of my good friends uh, who happen to be indigenous and happen to be artisans and working in ways in which they interact with visitors. Uh, you know they're frank; they're very new to a lot of the social web tools. And you know I'll get a response from them via email via email. You know nine months after I send something to them. Um, at the same point, a lot of the kids and a lot of this, you know, new generation, this next generation, you know, it's a, it's, it's, Facebook isn't a nice to have, it's a must have, and it's just the most natural thing. Yep. And again, the question is, all right, let's, how do we use this? And how do we use this in a way of uh, not yeah. pursuing our own agendas much, as much as learning to listen and learning to be respectful? And if we can do that, if I can do that with crafts and artisanias, um, you know, can't we do that with parks and protected areas? Yeah, and and, and you used you used the word interactive, 
um, which um, yeah, this is what I'd like to get there because okay, we can live stream. We may be able to live stream some things, which means our I indigenous friends can listen in. But now, how do we listen to them? How do we use the technology so that they can have their? You know, they can't afford to come to the conference. Um, you know, they're somewhere remote. They can listen to what we live stream. How do we then hear and see what they are saying? I've just had an idea regarding um, regarding Gunwinkle people. I've got several videos that we made with petrol sniffers out in the bush with people like my old sister who died a couple of years ago. And I'm just wondering if there's some way I could get those on computer and invite my relatives to have a look at those because one of the things that really grabs them is photographs. In fact, I'm just waiting on a couple of calendars. Remember, Rhonda, I, I, sent, I think I sent you a photograph of what happened on New Year's Day. Did I? When we I all, so. when, when we, well, we, Michael and I went to Bagot Reserve and we all threw flour and eggs at one another. Oh, right. I think I heard about it. Didn't see it, yeah. But <laughs> now, re now, remember, we are concentrating on, on wildlife tourism and on National parks yes, here. Yes, uh, yes, so, I mean, but, sure, okay, but, but listen, you, you, you can't that. think it in the boxes. And I'm not. But, so, okay. and but can I you have, make another I video? Have, I have a okay. video of my sons playing uh, the blue tongue lizard dreaming on, on Didgeridoo okay. out in the bush. They were doing that to clean up the song, the song line, so it would be safe for visitors, right? And the okay. reason they wanted to do that was that because the old man was dead, his spirit would still be around, so that song needed to be played by Mako, by the Dridu, through smoke to clean it up. Smoke right, oh, good. So I've got that. I've got out with these petrol sniffers, and they're picking up tracks and, 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 and showing me and Rowan various things. So, I mean, I'm not talking about something that's totally divorced. Sure. Okay. So, sorry. No. No. What I was thinking. Yeah, that would be good too. But what I'm thinking about is so that they can really give messages to the Congress. You've got a few months between now and the Congress, between now and November. Would you be able to interview a few people on oh. video, specifically about what messages they would like to get to the Congress? Uh, I could try. I want, to, I want to interject. Um, Denise, I love what your points were, and I certainly see the idea of needing to talk outside that immediate box. Um, and Rhonda, I see where you, where you want to direct the conversation. I think you know, that, that's fine. Um, but I think you know, for the Congress organizers, the question is you know, listening to people like Denise and listening to other people for some of these views points. Otherwise, the indigenous track is just going to be listening to people without as much to say as we could get if we were to listen outside the boxes. Um, and again, there, there's no, uh, there is no magic solution here. Uh, there is no uh, one-size-fits-all remedy. Uh, what, what I have certainly is a great deal of um, aspiration and, and great optimism for this event, as well as an equal dose of some sort of skepticism and some cynicism. Uh, as I deal with indigenous peoples uh, and having been invited to Australia back in 2007 for the Aboriginal Tourism Australia event uh, is an understanding that there are a number of disconnects uh, with, with, uh, with wildlife, with tourism, with indigenous peoples and yeah. And the, and the number one solution, I think, is, is listening and figuring out what, what's happening on local terms and figuring out where to go from there. I mean, you know, this, you know my example was, you know, in 2007, invited to this big event, being the keynote speaker at Aboriginal Tourism Australia's Expo, but then also meeting up with Rhonda on my own accord, you know, afterward. Um, I remember this one fellow who had, what was it, the river dancing in Brisbane? Um, but, you know, they did a, an Aboriginal uh, dance uh, program in Brisbane, 
And the question is, well, you know, again, how do you connect these different aspects? Um, and it's not it's not for me to solve this, but it's me to say, uh, I think for most visitors, we have a multitude of interest. And for the most part, yeah. whether we're dealing with a tourism of, uh, tourism or parks, we often tend to look at these things as if we're mono. Um, what's the word then? You know, we have these. M m monothematic interest. Yeah. You know, I am an ecotourist, I only want to go to the park. <laughs> and talking, you know, talking to Rhonda, I said, well, you know, excuse me, I know you're going to these, I know you're going to the reserves and the parks. At the same point, you know, we're landing in Brisbane, or, you know, we're taking, or, you know, we're flying yeah, sure. in or out. And so how do we connect the cities? You know, when I wrote a book, uh, uh, Mexico Adventures in Nature, back in 1998, I had to fight with a publisher talking about Mexico City. Uh, and again, Mexico City is still, is still one of the places that I love most in the world. But they said, how is that eco? How is that, you know, how is that adventure in nature? And I said, well, you know, the fact is, is that most of, you know, Mexico City has wide swaths of city parks and of agricultural areas and of areas that are, that are you know, green. But the second point is most people are flying in and out of there. That's your transport hub. So if we don't address that, and we, if we don't address the people who are making um, some in, uh, attempts to make that a greener place, then I think we do a disservice to the visitor and to the local. And what we've seen in 20 years since is an incredible uptake in, in renewable energy, in green gardens, in green walls, in rooftop gardens, in biking, all of these things that are happening in one of the world's largest cities. And, you know, is that the same thing as being in the Montes Azules Biosphere Reserve? Is that the same thing as visiting the monarch monarch butterflies or the or the whales? No, but it's part of that you know larger ecosystem that we're talking about. Oh yeah, sure. Well, what about birds at sewage ponds? Exactly. You know, and we see some you know we see some wonderful places for birding in in uh, in Mexico City. I don't know if you know uh, Rhonda met Marlena Ehrenberg. Uh, a wonderful guide in Mexico City and loves to go to the Xochimilco Gardens in the southern part of the city and, and know, you know, so many wonderful things. But you have to be you know, open-minded enough to think, hey, I can see nature in this urban environment. And yeah. you know, frankly, if we, can't protect the, if we can't protect nature in an urban environment, are we really going to care enough to protect the nature in in rural environments. Yeah, oh, I, 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 I totally agree with all that and in fact I've written a few papers on uh, urban wildlife and uh, we've, we did have a, we did have a um, day tour in my own, com country, uh, in my own company, Aracaria Ecotours, uh, wild in, uh, you know, wildlife in Brisbane or Brisbane Wildlife or something like that. We've actually cut that one out now because we don't have so many koalas anymore. We used to be able to show people wild wild koalas every time. But anyway, yeah, no, I totally agree with all that. I'm just thinking that um, the, um, the emphasis of the Congress is world parks, isn't it? Does that include city parks? Or I, I was thinking it was just mostly including national parks. Or does it include all sorts of parks? You'd have to ask them. Uh, that, okay. said, that said, you know, there, there are a number of national parks, uh, you know, in nearby that area, but you know, the fact is, is that any conservation event, you know, any you know international conservation event takes place in a city. And yeah. I would love to see, you know, I would love to see the you know the ecotourist guide to these major cities, whether it's whether you know, whether it's Brisbane yeah. or whether Good it's idea. Mexico City or whether it's Sydney or on and on Hyderabad, because uh, if we're, again if we're not if we're not walking the talk, if we're not walking the walk, you know, then you know, if the ideas are up here in the ether and they're not, they're not connected. Um, I want to, I, I, excuse me, but I want to wind this down, and um, and I'd like to ask if there are any final comments. We we have had our question and answer applications, and uh, someone. Uh, Riceburn Wilson talking about his love of amaranth. Ooh, we love that grain from the Americas. Um, but any final comments before we wrap this up today? 
Yeah, I, I was just going to make a comment about about parks um, and uh, eco tourism within cities, and and quite a few of my corner books have actually been on areas around cities. My first the first bird book I was involved in was Common Birds of the Darwin area, um, and uh, my la our last the fauna our last bird book was Birds of Palmerston, a town that we lived in at the time. Um, that, I mean, I, I've just I've just come back from Columbia as a speaker, keynote speaker at the Columbia Bird Festival, and you know that. Excuse me. Wait. Wait a minute. Which Columbia? Columbia, South America. South America. Thank you. South America. And the the thing is that country is just opening up, and a lot of people I know in my PhD research, a lot of people who answered my questionnaire and in my interview said there's no way we would go to Colombia. And yet what's happening in the city, cities like Manizales, is this, they're saying we're safe. Uh, there's a coffee growers association that has opened hotels. They're supporting bird watching. They get, they're trying to attract American and other bird watchers in. So, I mean, there's a lot that goes on in and around cities. So I think that's a really good point. That we've, we've got to try and involve cities. Yeah. Most people live in cities. Yes. Yeah, I, I was just trying to do another screen share then because uh, we have the Adelaide Wildlife Trail that Wildlife Tourism Australia started some time back. We also had a South East Queensland Wildlife Trail uh, where you can go to see wildlife within two hours of Brisbane, including Brisbane itself. So, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with all that. Um, yeah, just um, I'm finding it a bit hard to communicate with the uh, world co with the uh, Congress people. I suspect that it's not until I pay my 1,100 registration fee <laughs> that I'll uh, that I'll get to uh, to really communicate a few things. But um, I agree. Yeah. I agree, and, and I can't say that much. You know, I'm an independent voice here. I work with the, the Tapas Group, the Tourism and Protected Area Specialist Group, but. Uh, and I'm in connect in in contact with the folks who are organizing, and I'll be uh, talking more with them at this end end of the month. But I don't want to presume to speak for them, and I certainly yeah. want to say, you know, you know, what a wonderful topic to to focus on. So here's where I'd leave it. Um, thank you both for for conversing. Uh, stay online for a little bit afterward. Um, let's have this conversation again in a month or in six weeks. Um, and see if we can bring bring in some more people. Um, I think the topic of connecting, you know, connecting all of these dots is uh, is much needed, and we really need to see some good examples. Um, I posted a series of five questions uh, on this page, talking about how we figure out what are you know good and poor examples of of wildlife travel, of uh, how to um, make some improvements. Uh, if you have answers, please do that. But if you have other resources, uh, please you know share that as well. Yeah. Um, one one uh, question for you, Rhonda. We were getting a question in our Q and A app. It only took an hour. Uh, but uh, Rhonda, can you mention the title of your book one more time? <laughs> yeah. Um, to get it exact, I'll just look that up again. Oh, where is it? Yes, here it is. A hand. Uh, yeah, sorry. Wildlife tourism: a handbook for tour guides, eco lodges, students, and startup businesses. Oh, could I also mention I've got a oh wait on sorry, I've got a um, survey going at the moment on SurveyMonkey for tour operators and researchers, and the sorts of things they'd like to see from our network. So um, I might put that on uh, Wikipedia because I'd, I'd like a few people. Well, um, our treasurer Peter Wood and myself are at the moment also writing a chapter for a book on science in tourism, and so it would be good to get a lot of feedback before our meeting next month. We want to get our chapter in at the end of this month. Oh, could I also just very quickly because we haven't really heard much from Gaston? Uh, what are the sorts of things when you come to Australia? What is it that brings you halfway across the world? Uh, I've been told by tourism. Wait, no, wait, I won't mention. You've asked them a question. Yeah. Gaston, what brings yeah. you to Australia? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if I choose Australia, it was mostly for its amazing wildlife um, 
and it's quite um, famous in Switzerland, I would say, to travel around Australia, especially to to see the amount of mammals there are in here. Right. And let me and ask you, you one, would one, you one, one, also one, have... Wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh I'm, I'm just being nasty here, Rhonda. I'm sorry. But Gaston, how did you find <laughs> Rhonda? How did you come across... Sorry? How did you, how did you come across Rhonda's uh, digital oh, program? Uh, well, as she said it before, I'm a member of the Wu, the Wu thing. Uh, it's um, an organization of willing workers on organic farms. And when we are a member of that organization, we got a book that registers all the hosts they are in Australia. And in that book, I saw the, um, the Rhonda's page, who especially said that we could see some platypus <laughs> here. And as I was really interested in watch one, um, that's how I found her. Yeah. And uh, I was just going to ask uh, Gaston too whether he would be interested in seeing a bit of Aboriginal culture while he's travelling around oh, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Because, uh, I'm disappointed in the lack of enthusiasm from a lot of fellow Australians. They grow up thinking, oh well, you know, Aboriginals are sort of on the fringe of things, whereas I find most of our international visitors, they really want to meet and talk with Aboriginal people while they're in Australia. They don't want to just hear about it from white people or see an Aboriginal dance on the stage. They'd like some actual contact with with the Indigenous folk. That, 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 that's an interesting comment because I've often found too that people, the, the client, my clients, several of my clients have said to me, look, we're really interested in Aboriginal people. We don't want to meet them. We, don't, we would feel like voyeurs. But we're happy for you to tell us about your involvement. And then there are other people like John John Franson, who went to Arnhem Land with his brother and me, and sat around on veranda, dirty verandas playing with dogs and skinny kids for most of the day until we were able to go out bush and just loved it, you know, and just fit in, you know. So I think the, you know I think the one question is understanding you know what's expected, and you know when you see. Uh, when you see so much of misrepresentation in mainstream media uh, for the foreign traveler, the you know the the question is, well, you know, what am I getting into? Uh, and that's again why I'm such a big, big fan of uh, Radio National in Australia. Yeah, I think, Radio National. Yes. Uh, I, th I think yeah, your yeah. I think your program I think the programs uh, on that network are just you know nothing short of outstanding in terms of. Of listening to Aboriginal people talk about themselves, um, and you know the program, you know. But again, you have. But again, who is directing you to to such niche programming? Mm. Um, but you know, we'll, let's let's continue this conversation. Yeah. Uh, any other final comments before we wrap up? It's it's been more than an hour. <laughs> yes. Denise, any final comments? No, nice meeting you on after all this time. So wonderful to chat with you. Rhonda, any final comments? I'm sure I'll think of some five minutes after we say goodbye. <laughs> well, that would work. I am so pleased with how these uh, hangouts are maturing. So we will continue this and we'll have this again. Um, yeah. Stick around. I'm going to click the stop broadcast button. And for those who have submitted questions, uh, thank you for your participation. And we will continue this conversation. Cheers. <laughs>